levels here. This is Jeremy Bassetti, and you're listening to Travel Writing World, a podcast featuring interviews with travel writers about their work and about the business and craft of travel writing. You can find the episode show notes, free travel writing resources, and much more at travelwritingworld.com. This is episode 62 of the Travel Writing World podcast. Joining me today is Sophie Roberts, whose most recent book, The Lost Pianos of Siberia, was nominated for the Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year. Now, we recorded this back in March before the award announcement. Sorry for the massive delay, Sophie. But the conversation is still fresh, I think. We talk about success narratives and travel literature, chronology and travel books, and um, we just talk about so much. And it's so packed with information that you won't want to miss it. And definitely check out Sophie's book, which is easily one of the standout travel books of late. Anyway, uh, that's all coming up in the interview. In travel writing news, awards competitions are beginning to open back up. So Trav Media and Nat Geo Travel Writing Awards are now accepting submissions. So keep your ear to the ground as other competitions begin to open up as well. Author events are also happening again, with Stanford's in London announcing a few in August. Uh, Encouraging news for sure, but uh, continue to be safe out there. Ryan Murdoch speaks with Sarah Wheeler about Russia, Antarctica, and storytelling in his Personal Landscapes podcast, which is worth uh, a listen. And finally, there are a few new critical articles on nature writing, one by Charles Foster for Emergence Magazine and another by Catherine Schultz for The New Yorker. You can find links to these news stories on my monthly Genius Loci newsletter. Just visit travelwritingworld.com forward slash loci, L-O-C-I, to subscribe. It's free and you'll get monthly roundups of news related to travel writing and adjacent topics. In my personal update, uh, the semester is coming to a close and I'm looking forward to a few weeks off. I've absolutely nothing planned. Maybe I'll do some yard work or something, but I don't know. Yeah, definitely need this break after this past academic year. Um, uh, A few weeks ago, I went to go see the new documentary about Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. There were, you know, there was some media attention on the fact that producers deep faked Anthony Bourdain's voice to say like a whole of like a sentence, maybe five words or something. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think that attention is is just a distraction from the documentary's other issues. It's flaws like vilifying Asia Argento without at least inviting her to defend herself. I know she has her own problems and controversies uh, that she's dealing with. But, uh, you know, from the perspective of a documentary that purports to make some type of truth claim about the life of an individual, I think the producers acted in bad faith not to even invite her to defend herself. Anyway, curious to know what your thoughts are about it if you've seen the film. And lastly, I've published uh, two short articles on my website. One is a travel piece about two artificial mountains in Las Vegas. And the other is a how-to piece about capturing location data and note-taking apps for the iPhone. You can check those out at jeremybassetti.com. So it was great to hear from everyone over the last few weeks. Alison Lear said, I managed to catch up with a Nick Hunt episode at lunchtime today. What a great listen. Absolutely love the book. Yeah, I think uh, Nick is one of the authors having an event or two at Stanford's next month. So do stop by and check that out. And Ryan Gibbs said about the last episode with Lori Lee, riveting discussion about the book, including its representations of place, culture, and gender. Yeah, I think um, the the gender question is, is particularly important in in travel literature. And this is something that uh, Sophie Roberts and I address at the beginning of this uh, this new episode. So tune in for that. As always, thanks for reaching out, everyone, and supporting the show. If you want to get in touch, you can tweet me at Jeremy Bassetti, or you can leave a comment on the show at travelwritingworld.com and find the episode. While the show is free, it isn't cheap, so please consider telling your friends about the show, leaving a review on the Apple Podcasts app or whichever podcasting app you use, 
or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month, less than a cup of coffee at travelwritingworld.com forward slash support. So now, here is Sophie Roberts. Sophie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me, Jeremy. And congratulations on your Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year nomination for The Lost Pianos of Siberia. Uh, it was thrilling and much um, to my surprise, but alongside some other wonderful books, including uh, a, a, a lovely uh, um, emphasis on Russia. Um, there was another wonderful book, Owls of the Eastern Ice, that's been nominated, which is one of my favorites of the last 12 months. So it was good to see Russia getting such a good showing. Mm-hmm. And it's good to see uh, a, a lot of women getting um, nominated as well. Travel writing, as as you know, um, tends to tends, tends to be a, a, a man's affair, and it, when it it's more inclusive, that's always a welcome uh, welcome. Nod. Yeah, it's a really inclusive list, and it's great to see um, some some really really strong women writers on it, um, and people I admire. And yeah, it's an interesting point. It's a moment when. Um, I think, uh, golly, maybe men had more opportunity to travel than women over the years. Mm-hmm. Maybe, um, maybe men didn't have to look after children back home. I've always been, well, I have been very lucky because in this book I've recently done about um, Siberia and I got a very kind husband who's looked after <laughs> my children for weeks and weeks That's and good. weeks on end while I was away. But it's challenging. Good. Well, we, that's what we're here to talk about, your new book, Lost Pianos of Siberia. And I guess um, we'll, we'll begin at the end. And don't worry, I won't give anything away. Um, but near the end of the Lost Pianos of Siberia, uh, you note traveling to the Altai Mountains area of Siberia, I guess on the border of Mongolia. And you were being led by a gold tooth ranger on a snowmobile in like 20 degrees wet, minus 20 degrees weather. And then out of nowhere, four armed border guards in white camo appeared on snowmobiles and basically arrested you. <laughs> so uh, it seems like a, a scene in James Bond, in a James Bond film. But back us up a, a little bit. Like, what took you to Siberia to begin with? What were you doing there? Well, it's interesting. My journey in Siberia actually began in Mongolia, which sits just on the southern boundary. And I'd been going to Mongolia for many years. It's a place dear to my heart and to my families, where I'd made great friends with a family, um, a Mongolian woman called Enke and her husband, German, called Christopher. And they had three children. Our children were pretty much brought up together in the summers. And um, over the years, I went back again and again and again. And there was one summer in 2015 where we were all staying in these tents, these Mongolian gares, which sit above um, a snaking river, Orkon, about eight hours outside the capital in Bator. It's a very remote area where there are more horses than people. It's Mm. totally beautiful. And there was a young woman there that summer called Ogdorel Sampilnorov, a pianist of of immense talent. And she was playing on a Yamaha um, grand piano that these friends of ours had brought in from the city um, for her to teach the Mongolian children, the herder children, um, how to play. And in the evening, she would give recitals. And this was a woman who was not just any old pianist. Um, uh, My friends and um, some others, including I think it was the Italian ambassador, got involved in sponsoring her to study for eight years in Perugia at the conservatory there in Italy. So she was the is a deeply talented pianist Mm -hmm. and can you imagine the privilege of hearing her play in this in this area in this remote area in a tent at night and um, the 20 of us listening with the sound just rolling off this kind of felted walls um, rising up through the hole in the in the tent into a starry sky above nothing else there I mean it's divine it's how it's how music should be heard, (laughs) intimate, live, so far from anything recorded, from anything electronic. It was just so powerful. She was playing Bach. And I I leant over to my friend and I said to him, my German friend, Christoph Gierke, and I leant over to him and I said, I don't think I've ever heard something, anything so beautiful. And he is far more musically educated than me. Um, And he said, tutted, he sort of shook his head and tut tutted and said, no, 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 that piano is not worthy of her talent. Mm. You, Sophie, must go find her one of, and he used this phrase, 
the lost pianos of Siberia. And I think he knew he was saying it too. You know, I'm a storyteller. He used to make films himself and he unleashed a, a sense of curiosity in me. Uh, uh, he knows my affection for the absurd. And uh, I just couldn't get it out of my head, this phrase that put two things together that didn't belong together. And the power was in that in that surprise, I suppose. So I managed to engineer a, 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 an assignment for the Financial Times um, in Siberia, um, working with a wildlife conservationist, a, a tiger um, conservationist in the Russian Far East. And I went out there and something happened. I, I Something really quite magical happened, which is a bit like falling in love and an obsession took hold that um, held me in its thrall for the next three, four years while I went hunting across this enormous territory to see what truth there was in that phrase, the lost pianos of Siberia. Mm -hmm. And and so part of the the quest is uh, not just trying to find lost pianos in this kind of vast, sleepy space, but also find one for your friend. Indeed. To, to, Indeed. to bring back. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But it was a funny one because I was always looking for her. I was always searching for something that, that would be appropriate for her talent. But I also always had a sense that, and I don't have a problem with this, I always had a sense that even if I failed, the attempt was worth it. Um, that was very important to me because otherwise I wouldn't have kept on going. You know, I read some John Steinbeck um, um, he visited the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, um, with the photographer Robert Kappa shortly after World mm -hmm. War II. And he talked about um, the big chance of failure being present on that journey. And he said, you know, we made our plans in this way. If we could do it, it would be good and a good story. And if we couldn't do it, we'd have a story too, mm. the story of not being able to do it. And that really appealed to me because so much travel writing is the narrative of success. You know, it's about getting to the top of the mountain. It's about you know, a kind of patriarchal um, uh, 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 sort of view of the world of of, um, uh, of winning and planting the, the flag. elements, beating mm -hmm. the elements. And I, I, I wanted this story to be more nuanced than just beating the elements. Siberia is very cold; it's brutal. All of those things, but people live there. Mm -hmm. You also, at this point in the book that I referenced earlier, um, I, I thought there was a very nice nod there. You, you mentioned uh, possibly spotting a snow leopard. <laughs> and of course, you know, this very subject that you're speaking about now, uh, Matheson goes uh, and tries to find a snow leopard and very famously uh, doesn't succeed in, in doing that. But the story is much more uh, than that. So that's that was an interesting mm -hmm. connection there. But we won't reveal what happens. It's uh, <laughs> and but on that point, actually, I've just read the most extraordinary book by Paolo Cognetti called Never Reaching the Summit, oh, right. which is mm -hmm. about that as well. And that is a very, it's a quite a slim book by an Italian, young Italian author. And I'm, I, I find something very powerful and truth telling about these stories where success is not a given. Um, in fact, it's not necessarily um, the, 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 the end game. Mm -hmm. I wanted to succeed but I was so drawn into this place and its history that it was satisfactory enough just to keep on going, to keep on trying. Okay. So, so tell me about this place and, and your fascination, fascination with it. Like, I, I think out of our ignorance, or I can only speak for myself, but I tend to think of like Siberia as a vast and like sleepy, desolate wasteland, tundra, right? A place associated with uh, concentration camps, gulags, right? Um, but the, the Siberia that you document in this book is, is full of life and history and culture. And, um, you know, you, 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 um, the history that you chart uh, of the movement of pianos throughout the region is uh, fascinating and, and surprising because we don't associate this place with, uh, with pianos and cultures, or at least I, I didn't prior to reading your book. So can you give us like a sense of, uh, you know, what Siberia means to you and perhaps, um, you know, an overview of, of Russia's relationship with pianos? Of course. the I mean, you're absolutely right um, that we associate Siberia um, as this kind of sleepy, desolate tundra, um, a place of enormous suffering. <laughs> and we're right to, we are right to, you know, Siberia is, its etymology is, is comes from a word that basically means the sleeping land. Mm -hmm. um, it is 
um, unpopulated. It covers an 11th of the world's land surface. Kamchatka is in the same time zone as Auckland, New Zealand. You know, that's nine hours ahead of Moscow. It's a vast, vast area with not a lot of people in it. It's desolate. Um, you, you're right to say that. It also has a dark history. You've got, um, it was, you know, described as the largest continental prison without a roof under the SARS. You know, from 1801 to 1917, we're talking about a million subjects were banished to Siberia um, under the penal exile system. You know, these were people that were banished for doing nothing wrong, except mm -hmm. perhaps taking snuff in the streets of Petersburg. Then you also have another phase when all the forced laborers dying in the Soviet gulags. Um, from 29 to 53, you're talking about 2.7 million forced laborers. Those are slightly contentious figures, but dying in the Soviet gulag, many of them in Siberia. So it's got a really, really dark history that I don't shy away from, but that's the story we know. I wanted to tell the story we don't, which was this extraordinary relationship with the piano that, um, that Siberia had um, over the course of the instrument's 200-year history. And that was what I started to trace. Because what happened was, if you think of Siberia um, beginning in the Ural Mountains, which are on the western edge of the territory I'm talking about and going all the way to the Pacific, um, to Kamchatka and Vladivostok. And um, west of those Ural Mountains, you have Moscow and St. Petersburg, which are the center of the, you know, the political universe, the economic universe, and also of our imaginative universe when we think of Russia. Mm -hmm. But what was happening is that those, those power cities were beginning to spread their, their governors and and their, um, their elite through into Siberia. So they started to colonize it. And those governors, mavericks, misfits, explorers, explorers' wives, geographers, scientists, um, also uh, dissidents, very uh, aristocratic political dissidents. In the, uh, there's a particular group called the Decembrists in the 1820s. They would start to move across into Siberia for whatever reason they were there for. And they wanted to hold on to the things that mattered to them. They wanted to hold on to their identity, which they'd grown up with in Petersburg and Moscow in that region. And part of that identity was very cultured. It was bourgeois. It was around this newfangled instrument called the piano, which had a, a deep feverish um, uh, um, uh, profile in that strata of Russian society. Mm -hmm. And so they did. They went against all odds and they, they carried these instruments over into Siberia when there was no railways, when there was no roads. You had to take them in on the back of a sledge. And I found that just extraordinary and um, alluring because what is it that one feels so uh, attached to that they would they would go so far as to to travel so far with these instruments strapped onto the back of a of a of a little sledge. Mm -hmm. What I what I enjoyed about the book is you know learning a, a little bit about the history of pianos and the history of piano manufacture. Um, so you chart. Um, I think your book is broken down into three sections chronologically in terms of time periods um, in, in Russia. So at uh, the beginning, you, you, you mentioned the introduction of, of pianos into Russia with Catherine the Great and her, you know, her great love for the music and, and you know, spreading pianos that way. But what was interesting, uh, and I, I didn't know uh, until your book, not that I would have any <laughs> opportunity to know this, but, um, you know, with the Soviets basically uh, cutting off the importation of uh, foreign pianos and then, you know, this vibrant industry of Russian-made pianos uh, – blossoming within within the Soviet Union um, and fascinatingly the the pianos that you track down in the book they're treated as I, I would say somewhat character like in that you know they have names they have numbers right you 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 note the serial numbers of each piano and you try to tell the piano's story which is just lovely it's a fascinating thing to read. Well, I was given um, great confidence by one of my favorite books by Edmund Duval called The Hair with Amber Eyes, where he uses an object, a Netsuke, to tell the biography of his family. Mm -hmm. And I, he had a he had a line in there which just, it just stayed with me all through this, which objects have always been carried, sold, bartered, stolen, retrieved, and lost. 
people have always given gifts. It's how you tell their stories that matters. And that I found so empowering that I could use a piano as a, almost a character in the book, as you say. And once you open up the top board of this instrument, you open up and you look at the, it's broken strings, it's got a cracked soundboard, it's not going to sound great anymore. It might not even sound at all, but you're also in opening it up, you're, um, you're digging into a history that, uh, that a relationship that that instrument has had with somebody who's abandoned it for a reason um, or who's loved it for a reason again and and in in quite difficult circumstances um so you have these phases you, um, and very um, traumatic phases in russian history the the revolution mm -hmm. um the gulags um perestroika and then the boom that comes with the oligarchies of now. And these pianos represent those movements as well um, because of the stories that their owners can tell. You know, I encounter a Beckstein in a tiny little um, house in a small village outside the town of Tomsk where um, I discovered that that piano was sold for the, a bag of potatoes, a bag mm. of potatoes in the revolution. Um, by an old lady who just had to sell her last thing to eat. Um, I discovered um, um, other instruments in the Altai Mountains, which had been distributed by a uh, man who felt so passionately that culture belonged to everyone. Um, after he'd heard a child playing on a keyboard that had been, um, or didn't hear a child, of course, but saw a child playing on a, a, a keyboard painted onto a kitchen table. And he thought that was such a tragedy that he went off and got lots of instruments from um, richer people in Moscow who were throwing them out and distribu he distrib distributed something like 41 pianos to these mountain villages. Um, another piano, one of my kind of my the finds I was most proud of was an instrument of, that I encountered very early on in my search, a Russian made Sturzwager that was in the city of Khabarovsk that a piano tuner had led me to because he thought it was very old and very interesting. And it was in private hands. And that had been sold in Perestroika for a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, wow. because the family, the family needed to survive. And with the help of Russian television, I put out a, an appeal to see if any, we could find the original owner. Um, the, the, the current owner thought it belonged to a school teacher, remembered the neighborhood. I knocked on doors randomly. I knocked on kindergarten doors, randomly found nothing. Then we put a piece out in the Russian media, and two days later, we got a call. And that call led to the owner of that piano. It had been in her possession for something like 70 years, and it belonged to her aunt who brought that instrument in from St. Petersburg to the city of Tobolsk on the back of a sledge. So it was kind of amazing that these stories came from just opening up the top board, finding a serial number, and then hunting and searching for the story it held it held in its in its bones. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are some instances where some of the pianos that you're trying to find, because you see in photographs, like the the, the photograph the photograph of the piano in. Um, in, in the building where the SARS were executed, um, you know, you're 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 also trying to to, to find these kind of fabled, uh, infamous uh, pianos, and uh, you're meeting a great deal of resistance in the community and suspicion from people uh, that you're looking into these things, uh, which is also uh, fascinating. You you mentioned uh, piano tuners helping you out along the way. Uh, one of the uh, amazing things uh, about the piano tuners and the musicians that uh, you speak with. Um, and you mentioned this earlier about uh, your mus musician friend saying um, about Ogdrill uh, that the Yamaha grand piano wasn't worthy for her, right? And it's just fascinating how the, the tuners and the musicians, uh, fascinating the way that they speak about the special nature of each piano and their sounds, right? Oh, um, they talk absolutely. about its unique timbre, its unique temperament, the shape of the sound. It's like they have access to a special world or, or language inaccessible to, to, to people like you and me. Um, so this is a long way to ask this question then. Like, why not just find your friend uh, um, a newer piano? Like Yamaha Grand is an amazing piano. Why, why, 
find a worthy piano, a lost piano of Siberia for her. Uh, I think that that was the kind of the magic of of the the whole endeavor because um, Ogdorel, her family had a Siberian history. Um, uh, her family were from Buryatia, which is an area around Lake Baikal that um, under the um, this during the Stalin period it was heavily repressed. Um, a lot of the Buryats were murdered; others fled. And so she, there's a strong link with Siberia and Mongolia, and also there's a strong there's a strong feeling of history. And I mm-hmm. think that there is a respect and a, and a sort of sensibility that we talked about. Um, we talked about, and we felt that that there was a sort of we wanted to pursue the spirit of place and the spirit of history. And this isn't going to be the instrument that she's going to perform on. This is the instrument for her home. Um, this is the instrument she can practice on. This is the instrument that carries feeling and and carries a connection that runs deeper than just, you know, having the money to buy a brand new piano from a shopping mall in Ulaanbaatar. You, you mentioned in the book, and I was just flipping to the section because I highlighted here um, about how an object can lose its meaning when it's lost its story. And so here the story um, kind of imbuing the object with a special aura and in some ways like an instrument, making it even sound perhaps even sound better that story mm, you know you've 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 kind of caught the thing that sometimes when i was really doubting myself um when it was really tough and i was really cold and really tired and i just <laughs> you know encountered yet another error that had just been flooded by a broken pipe and no one knew its story and you know there was some real really there was some, it was a long process. Um, but that little bit of poetry, that little bit of beauty, that little bit of solace and survival and humanity that opened up with an instrument that looked scratched or a bit broken, um, or imperfect or not as grand, uh, it became everything to me. It became everything to me. And it became also a passport. It became a way for, I'm a British journalist knocking on the doors of Russians <laughs> in strange places um, at a very difficult time during our relationship with Russia. Mm-hmm. And I say, hi, my name is Sophie. Have you got a, I've heard you've got a piano. Will you talk to me about it? Something happens. All those preconceptions um, that we both bring to the table fall away. Um, it was very neutralizing. And I would listen, they would talk, we would laugh, we would drink, and I'd end up spending three days all because of a search for a piano. So as a traveler and as a travel writer, it was it was the best passport. I've ever, ever held in my hands a simple question. Have you got a piano? Mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought this up um, because one of the the wonderful things, in my opinion, about uh, travel uh, writing, travel literature, it's, it's a genre in which we are, w- the reader is able to kind of take a peek behind the curtain and see uh, the inner workings or the behind the scenes um, of of the craft or what goes into actually writing a book. Uh, for example, you mentioned uh, from time to time dealing with interpreters, right? Speaking with uh, Russians about their pianos who don't have any English. And, and um, one of the things that you mentioned also in the book uh, on this note is is that you mentioned this in the author's note at the beginning that um, you were out of sync uh, in this book, meaning that the, the narrative that you constructed in the book and what we have in our hands when we read the book that narrative is out of sync and the chronology doesn't it, the events didn't happen necessarily in the order that we're reading them so i was wondering if um you know maybe what your your ideas here are about um i guess constructing and preserving uh narratives in in travel literature um does that make any sense yeah it makes a lot of sense because you've you're a very good reader because you've identified uh, where I struggled and where I had to find a solution. Um, 
this is the first book um, that I've written and I found it really hard. You know, my genre, my, my, my genre before this is magazine writing. Um, 3,000 words maximum, if I'm lucky. Mostly 1,600 words for a page for the Weekend Financial Times. Uh, 80,000 words, a totally different beast. Um, I originally approached it through the convention of a travelogue, um, starting in A, so the Ural Mountains on the west, on that map I described earlier, and finishing in Z, which was um, in Kamchatka. Mm-hmm. And hopefully Mongolia back to the beginning, but a very straightforward trajectory from one place to another. Um, I wrote that at 80,000 words. I thought I was pleased enough with it. I handed it over to my publishers and I was on my deadline. And the publishers came back to me and said to me, um, it's a good first draft. Now I want you to totally rewrite it. <laughs> and I want you to rewrite it according to the chronology of the piano. According to the m- moment the piano entered um, Russian and Siberian culture under Catherine the Great and finish it in the here and now. And that meant totally throwing the props away of the conventional travelogue, which is the journey that Mm -hmm. determines it and doing it through the chronology of the instrument, which had become such a character of the book. So I had to rewrite the whole thing. And that was tough. But as I got into it, I think that it was um, a brilliant, brilliant editor that sent me down that road because it it invigorated um, the storytelling um, and it also slightly um, broke 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 the genre that I had been I I've read from the day I could read. You know, it made me think in a new way, in a fresh way. And when you think in a new and fresh way, writing always gets better. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a tricky process, but one I went through. And then your question about the interpreters is again an interesting one because I've had a number of writers, good writers, good friends of mine say, "Golly, you certainly lay it all out, don't you? Why do you thank your interpreter so much in your and in your um, prologue?" Um, and indeed, I don't just thank her there. I talk about her all the way through the book. Um, when you are living and breathing, sharing a room, um, working 16, 17, 18 hours a day with someone and their words become my truth. They're my interpreter. I don't speak Russian. You have to. They they become part of you. It's like a mind meld. And the, the, how could I write the book and not acknowledge that depth? It, it wouldn't have made any sense. She becomes Elena Vitenka becomes an extremely important character in the book, um, right to the end. You know, when I'm when I'm gathered those I became close to for the sort of final journey. Um, so I was very I was very adamant that when somebody is such an important part of the act of travel and research, they should also be a very important presence in the pages of what I write. Mm -hmm. It's like she, she in some ways helped you uh, write this, this book. Oh, completely. I mean, you know, without her, um, I mean, you know, there were moments she, we were, we were pushing and pushing against each other and with each other and for each other. Um, But ultimately, um, I we learned to read each other without a spoken word when an interview is always best when the interview is finished <laughs> and <laughs> then you pause and then something else happens a, a different thing happens uh-huh. and she she understood how I work like that and she had the patience to 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 sit through it and and help me and you know I went through about four or five interpreters before I got to um Elena wow it's interesting um, on several uh, levels here, and I'm going to also circle back to this uh, this uh, note about the editor. You know, God bless the uh, a good editor, right, to help you uh, help people in general. You know, write and you know, hone in on on, on, the, on their craft. Um, but this idea of of frameworks um, and the quest here, it's it's wonderful because you know your quest is essentially to find a piano for your friend. Uh, but the book takes on a different form, and it becomes much more than just this quest. Much more than a travelogue, as you mentioned, it's it becomes a quest. But it's much more than that. It's also, uh, you know, wonderfully interdisciplinary, right? Um, as, as any good 
travel book should be, in my opinion. It it marries memoir with reportage, with you know political and social and and the history of music, right? The history of politics, social history. Um, you know, there's so much uh, packed in here. And, and <clears throat> excuse me. The question is, how how do you approach to um, you know balancing narrative with all of these other things, narrative and context, narrative and history, narrative and reporting. How, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have sort of various modes. As a reporter, I, 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 I write everything down. I record things too, but I write everything down because when I'm writing, um, when I'm writing even a conversation down, I'm also always catching the way the um, eye twitches or the hand moves, you know, those tiny uh, telling details that make a character out of a conversation. So what is it that James Wood talks about um, being a good noticer of things? I think Dr. Doolittle uses the same phrase, Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to be a good noticer of things. To notice is not just about taking lots of iPhone photos so you can describe the scene retrospectively. It's about, it's about those, uh, those twitches, um, I call them, and having a notepad to to write them in. So I've got. I'm looking just around my my, my um, around in my office now. I've got um, scores of books from Russia, and I and they were they they are my first tool. Um, and then I am quite you know as I worked into the history of it, and I worked into archives. That was a sort of organisational challenge, mm-hmm. um, no question, uh, and hugely enabled by so much of it now being you know it's incredible the resources that are available at a click of a button. Um, and in, in particular, and I think this is important just for people interested in the craft of writing. I'm a member of the London Library. It's one of the most extraordinary institutions for people that write. Um, it's a lending library. They send me old books whenever I need one. We get access to these amazing databases of academic archives and all the rest of it. It's extraordinary. Um, Russian archives were trickier, um, but I got there in the end. Um, it was just a case of endurance. And if this book was one thing, it was a it was an act of endurance, um, <laughs> sort of you know fighting through to get the stories and 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 join dots. Um, I yeah, it was an organisationally quite complex. But and it took a lot of drafts and it took really, really good editing from people. I had Morgan Entrican at Grove, who's one of the all time greats in America. And I had Andrea Henry here over in the UK at Doubleday with Transworld. So I had two people on both sides of the Atlantic who were um, who were clear and uh, ruthless in getting me to where I needed to get to with this difficult balancing act. And still now there is, you know, I have readers who don't understand why I go off on wild goose chases or why I take diversions where they think there should just be one single narrative. But life is messier than that. Travel is messier than that. And I, again, it's a bit like not having a sense of, um, I, I was never fear fearful of failure. I'm also not fearful of diversion. Um, it's my, I've always had eyes on the back of my head and curious for the thing that sits slightly on the other side of the rainbow. So that's me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's great though. Um, in some ways it's refreshing because, uh, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you read a lot of travel narratives and, uh, these types of books and, you know, sometimes there's the tendency to, to not include the, con- the context or not include enough about it um and especially with like feature writing too it's like we want to hear we want to read about the context we want to read about why something is the way that it is instead of just being all about the writer um and but there's on the other side too sometimes you know the tendency is to just like bury the narrative you know so deeply in 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 context that it kind of loses uh it it kind of get lost it gets lost in it so it it seems to me uh, it would be a the very delicate kind of balancing act to to get to get that mixture right. Mm, and a tricky one. Um, did I get it right? I'm not sure. I'm too close to it still. But the right. the the one thing, you know, I've had people say, oh, there's not enough you in the book. People that know me, there's not enough you in the book. But I was like, it's not about me. It's about pianos in Siberia. It's mm-hmm. about these Russians, these extraordinary people that survived the siege of Leningrad, that survived the revolution, that survived Stalin's gulags. You know, I, you don't need me in that. Um, the me is the show don't tell 
trying to do some good writing. And this is uh, no no criticism, but in some ways, you know, the character disappears. And they say that, you know, like very good writing, the writing disappears or, you know, the, the attention, the artifice of the writing doesn't get noticed. It's so clean and it's so good. And I would say, you know, for, for a good travel book, the, the, narr- the narrator, the, 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 the author sometimes needs to disappear and let the, let the book breathe. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Especially is it's, I don't know, I've kind of travel writing is going through a funny thing at the moment. Um, there's, there's nature writing, which is really powerful, very popular, very, very well. Um, there's a lot of talent in that space. That's nature writing is kind of, um, casting a big shadow over travel writing right now, certainly here in the UK. Um, and then the travel writing is, is, uh, is going more and more into the kind of, um, the sort of personal best narrative, you know, I got to the top of the mountain or I swum to the edge of the sea or I got to the, um, the, the last pole or whatever it is. And so it's very much about the, uh, uh, the, the summiter. Mm, (laughs) And I, I wanted to find something that sat uh, slightly away from those dominant trends that were um, less about the kind of ego and, and more about other people's stories. Um, at the end of the day, um, if this book taught me one thing is that people are more interesting than places. And I had to find the space to tell people's stories. I had to give them the, 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 I had to give them space and air. <laughs> That's what this book is, is trying to do rather than give my kind of, you know, personal history of why I'm interested in snow. People are more interesting than places. I think there's no better way to, to end an episode with than, than with such a strong punctuation mark there. So um, I was wondering if, if you could uh, read for us a, a short passage from, from your new book. Yes, of course. Siberia is far more significant than a place on the map. It's a feeling which sticks like a burr, a temperature the sound of sleepy flakes falling on snowy pillows and the crunch of uneven footsteps coming from behind. Siberia is a wardrobe problem, too cold in winter and too hot in summer, with wooden cabins and chimney stacks belching corpse grey smoke into wide white skies. It is a melancholy, a cinematic romance dipped in limpid moonshine, unhurried train journeys, pipes wrapped in sackcloth, and a broken swing hanging from a squeaky squeaky chain. You can hear Siberia in the big soft chords in Russian music that evoke the hush of silver birch trees and the billowing winter snows. Covering the eleventh of the world's landmass, Siberia is bordered by the Arctic Ocean in the north and the Mongolian steppe in the south. The Urals mark Siberia's western edge and the Pacific its eastern rim. It is the ultimate land beyond the rock, as the Urals used to be described, an an unwritten register of the missing and the uprooted, an almost country perceived to be so far from Moscow that when some kind of falling star destroyed a patch of forest twice the size of the Russian capital in 1908, no one bothered to investigate for 20 years. Before air travel reduced distances, Siberia was too remote for anyone to go and look. In the 17th century, wilderness was therefore ideal for banishing criminals and dissidents when the Tsars first transformed Siberia into the most feared penal colony on earth. Some exiles had their nostrils split to mark them as outcasts. Others had their tongues removed. One half of their head was shaved to reveal smooth, blue-tinged skin. Among them were ordinary, innocent people, labelled convicts on the European side of the Urals and unfortunates in Siberia. Hence, the habit among fellow exiles of leaving free bread on windowsills to help bedraggled newcomers. Empathy, it seems has been seared into the Siberian psyche from the start. With these small acts of kindness, the difference between life and death in an unimaginably vast realm. Siberia's size, 
also stands as testimony to our human capacity for indifference. We find it difficult to identify with places that are too far removed. That's what happens with boundless scale. The effects are dizzying until it is hard to tell truth from fat. Whether Siberia is a nightmare or a myth full of impenetrable forests and limitless plains, its murderous proportions strung with groaning oil derricks and sagging wires. Siberia is all these things and more as well. Just wonderful. I, I, I do hope you're, you are narrating the audiobook version of this. You're, the way that you read it is just so wonderful. And I think listeners can get a sense of, um, you know, just not just how beautifully written uh, this, this book is, but, you know, how, how um, deep, deep it will go into the idea of Siberia and later, um, you know, finding these, these wonderful pianos. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So uh, where can we find you online? I know you have this wonderful Instagram live series <laughs> that hopefully you can tell us about. Oh, so you know, that is quite fun. I've only started doing it in January. I do a, a talk on Instagram live called The Art of Travel. It's on my Instagram handle, Sophie Roberts. And um, I talk with people who make an art of travel, whether they're photographers, um, whether they are writers. Um, I've got some poets coming up and it's just a half hour of uh, lively and candid conversation with uh, people I admire, people that are new to me to give um, to give others and myself uh, new ideas when we're in this challenging time of COVID, as well as a sense of um, escapism and a kind of love for the world. Um, and so that's, I'm really enjoying that actually. But otherwise, my if you go to lostpianosofsiberia.com, that's the website for the book, which I, um, I'm proud of, not because of my own work, but because of a dear friend, Michael Turek, an American photographer who joined me for large parts of the journey, who's produced the most stunning set of images and his own photographic monograph, as well as you'll see some videos from behind the scenes. Um, Michael's currently developing a documentary about, um, about our travels together um, for Vice and You'll also hear some recordings of music um, with Ogdorel, um, and a beautiful recording that was made with the Mongolian um, uh, instrument, the Moran Hur, or the horsehead fiddle. It's a really haunting piece of music. Um, and it's all there on SoundCloud on lostpianosofsiberia.com. I'll put those links in the show notes, and I'll also encourage everyone to check out your, your Instagram Live uh, series because not just you have these wonderful conversations but we can see your beautiful bookshelf <laughs> behind you so that's uh, worthy of a visit in and of itself so thank you so it's always much. it's always backed by my novels my travel books are somewhere else i might have to change it now you've said that <laughs> change my background <laughs> well thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk with me today thank you very much indeed jeremy You can find the episode show notes and much more at TravelWritingWorld.com. Please remember to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app. And if you find the show valuable, please consider leaving a review or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month at TravelWritingWorld.com slash support.